Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can all hear me. Welcome to tonight's meeting of the Orders and Resources Committee, which is being broadcast and recorded via Microsoft Teams Live. My name is Councillor Steve Holes. I am chair of this committee and I will be conducting the meeting tonight. During the meeting, you will hear from members of the Audit and Resources Committee who are on your screen now. Also present are officers from Eastleigh Borough Council who are now shown on the screen. They will introduce reports that have been written for the committee tonight. If we have any non-committee members joining us, I will bring them in at relevant points and ask them to introduce themselves. If we experience a connection problem, this event will be paused. If a councillor loses connection or joins later, I will ask them to introduce or reintroduce themselves for the benefit of viewers. In the unlikely event of myself losing connection, the Vice Chair Alex Bourne will take over. The first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we have apologies from Councillor Tyson Payne. Um, Councillor Rob Rushton will be a little bit late to the meeting um, and I don't think Councillor Manning is here just yet. OK, thank you very much. Item two, declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of interest they wish to make on the agenda? Please indicate in the meeting chat and when called, please wait for the red box before stating the nature and reason for your interest. No, OK, nothing at the moment. Obviously, if something comes up during the meeting, you can indicate via the chat or raise your hand. Thank you very much. Item four, I don't believe there's any public participation now. No, that's right, Chair. OK, no questions from the public. Um, I think I think we've missed minutes at item three. Beg your pardon. Um, ah. Found it. My fault. I was reading the uh, script and scrolled down too far. Uh, item three, we'll go back to then, is the minutes of the last meeting held on the 9th of February on two, 2021. Do I have any comments on the minutes? Do I have a proposer and a seconder, please? I propose, Chair. I'll, I'll second, second Chair. Councillor Bourne proposed, Councillor Iris to second. Mm. Any comments? OK, all in favour say aye, unmute and say aye. Aye. Agreed. aye. Anybody against? Any abstentions? That's carried, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Item five is the EY 2019 20 audit annual audit letter. Do we have Ken, uh, Mr. Mathers here with us? You do, Chair. Uh, we do, Simon. You do. Uh, you do, and Janet as well. Hello. Welcome. Hello. Okay, would you like us to present? Yes, please. Okay, I think um, I'm hoping that you can hear me and see me and that the red box will follow to me. Yes, there we go. Right, super. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we've got two papers actually that are in the supplementary pack um, to present to you tonight. One, the first one, which I will take you through very briefly, is the summary um, letter. So our annual audit letter that summarises the work that we did for last year's audit, for the 2019-20 audit. It pulls together all of the key areas of um, risk and judgments that we made. Uh, we've reported this to the committee um, already in the past as we were concluding our work. And so it, it just pulls together that summary for all members of the council to be able to see the full extent of our work and the outcomes from that. Um, if I take you to page seven of the supplementary pack uh, and just uh, remind you of the, the key outcomes of our work. So we're required to provide an opinion on your financial statements. Um, for the year ending 31st of March 2020 um, and to provide you with a conclusion on your value for money arrangements and also to um, do some work on your governance statement 
um, and uh, your reporting into the National Audit Office in terms of whole of government accounts, how your numbers feed in there. And just the outcomes of, of that work was that we provided you with an unqualified financial statements opinion on the truth and fairness of the financial position of the council. However, we did um, include an emphasis of matter paragraph on the property plant and equipment valuation in there due to um, the valuation uncertainty that existed around the year end as a result, mainly of COVID. And we also included um, a material uncertainty paragraph on the key risks and issues that were highlighted in the council's disclosure note um, concerning um, the income losses, the potential for income losses, the council's ability to refinance its debt, um, the cost of replacement borrowing and the council's ability to borrow further should there be a need to. Um, and the reason that I flag that to you is um, so that you have that as a basis for when we talk about our second paper, which is what are we going to look at for the 2021 audit? In terms of the value for money arrangements, we concluded that the council had put in place proper arrangements to secure value for money during the year of 1920. Um, and we concluded on our WGA work, so our whole of government accounts work, um, just earlier this month and submitted that. So that has now gone in. Um, so that was all I was going to um, bring to your attention from that, but I'm more than happy to take questions around that uh, report. Okay, thank you for thank you for that, uh, Janet. Are there any questions from members on that part of the uh, report? Please indicate. Councillor Atkinson would like to speak, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Atkinson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to say thank you for just reminding us on the outcome of 2020 uh, and highlighting the issues, which I think you're going to deal more in the, your work for 21. So I won't comment on those in particular detail at the moment. But what I was going to just ask you about, if I may, you did produce for us a fees summary on page 41 or justification for fee rebasing mm -hmm. and I was quite intrigued to see in there that the number of significant issues for Eastleigh were nine um, and to be blunt that didn't compare very favourably with other councils when you bear in mind that county council has 10 which is clearly a significantly larger organisation than Eastleigh Borough Council and I just wondered how that influences the work and clearly it influences the fee and I assume that's going to go forward into next year when we've got the same significant risks if, if anything slightly more. Yes thank you councillor so um, I think your your analysis is entirely right and and what the objective is of our audit plan and then our reporting against that is to demonstrate to you where we assess the key risks for the audit in terms of being able to provide assurance over the financial statements and the arrangements for value for money. Um, and as you note, and as we are very clear in, in our reporting to you in terms of our planning and then our conclusion work, um, Eastleigh Borough Council has a significantly um, larger number of risks associated with its reporting due to the complexities of the arrangement that it arrangements that it um, has entered in, particularly around property valuation and property development but also um, the connections through to the Aegeus Bowl and, and the, the operation of, of that particular contract, um, all of which attract either you know, an element of judgment that's required from management and then from the auditors, um, or actually some technical accounting um, requirements, which again needs specialist input um, and require additional work, both from your finance team and then from, from us to be able to conclude that we are satisfied um, over the way in which it's being reported. Thank, thank you, Janet. Um, I was meant to bring uh, Councillor Grzeski in, who uh, isn't part of the committee, um, and she's reminded me that she had asked to speak on this item. So apologies for, for missing you, uh, <laughs> Judith. Would you like to speak now, please? Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, yes, well, well, Councillor Atkinson sort of stole a bit of my, 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 what I was going to say, but here goes. Um, and I'm going to refer to page seven of the agenda, 
and um, Janet's already talked about it, the bullet point referring to going concern um, and elsewhere in the, in the letter, um, a material uncertainty uh, concern around the um, extent and duration of uh, current income losses is uh, I think the phrase that's used. And uh, as I say, this indicates that there's a, a material uncertainty um, exists and it may cast significant doubt on the council's ability to continue providing the current level of services without an increase in planned income. Now, I, I've looked at other letters of, of, of councils that have published theirs already and had their meetings uh, um, within the county and not seen such a stark warning. Now, Chairman, one of the functions of this committee under the Constitution is to seek assurances that action is being taken on risk related issues identified by the auditors. So um, what action will this committee be looking for regarding the going concern uncertainties? Do you, do you want to answer that or do you want me to go on? Because no, I've got carry on. two questions. So that was one. Um, uh, page eight, and uh, this is page eight of the agenda, not necessarily page eight of the uh, report. Uh, when will the audit completion certificate be issued? And on page 16, it talks about uh, one of the significant risks being Horton Heath and refers to the delivery of approximately 1800 house homes. I, I, I thought it was significantly more than that. And on the audit fees, which Councillor Atkinson's already mentioned, um, nine significant risks. Um, you know, we're paying nearly £150,000 when um, most other neighbouring councils are paying around about 60,000. And this is obviously nothing, not because um, we're being overcharged or anything like that, because uh, <laughs> I'm sure we get value for money from our auditors. Uh, but how concerned is this committee uh, about the number of significant risks which have led to such a high fee? Uh, uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you for that, Judith. Um, Sarah, did you want to come in on any of that? Uh, yes, hold on. Sorry for the delay. Clicking the buttons is a little bit tricky. Um, yes, so I can pick up um, as many issues as I can. Um, regarding going concern, so um, we look at those things all the time and that's exactly what you would expect your external auditor to be looking at for you um, to ensure that we are covering as much of that as we can and that we have confidence going forward. So the recent budget that um, went through council this last month now, now we're in March, uh, that picked up the medium term financial plan that showed members and I hope gave comfort that we have the reserves in place to back things up. Plus we have a very prudent medium term financial plan. So that should uh, that should hopefully allay members concerns and obviously we'll review that regularly um, as, as we go forward because of the outcome of the COVID pandemic and seeing how we go on there. Um, Audit certificate, I'm going to leave that to Janet if that's OK. Uh, Horton Heath Homes, I think the report does say 1800. Um, it still it hasn't got to planning yet, so we don't know what the final number will be, but it is potentially higher than that. Yes, you're, you're right, Councillor Gwajewski. Um, and on the fee as well, I don't know if, if Janet, you want to pick that up first, but we've had lots of discussions internally um, and also with Simon and Janet to talk through the fee. And I think it, it absolutely reflects that we get an excellent level of service actually from EY now and that coupled with all the risks that Janet has covered um, absolutely explains why the fee is as it is but um, Janet did you want to come in on those couple of points? I can do yeah happy to um, so yes on on the fee um, as I explained there's a significant amount of work that is required because of the number of um, key judgments that are um, required to be able to provide that assurance that the audit, the, the financial statements are appropriately stated, um, and um, you know, there are there are a number of areas where that judgment is either because of um, a number of assumptions that support uh, the arrangements that you have, and and we need to test those and challenge those, and be satisfied that we've looked for contrary evidence to support what is actually being presented. Or, as I said earlier, it's to do with the technical accounting requirements, which are really quite specific in a number of cases and not necessarily the norm that you would find in a district council and their um, their arrangements. Um, so that's that's why we um, have a, a higher fee here than perhaps you would expect to see across 
um, you know, your your average district council, which Eastleigh is not. Um, on the certificate, actually, I just let me just confirm with Simon. He's either going to nod or shake his head <laughs> as to whether or not we've issued it yet. But it was held. It was held open on the basis that he's nodding. Okay, that's good. On the basis that we needed to complete the whole of government accounts um, submission, and that was delayed, um, not due to Eastleigh or the audit team, but actually to do with a glitch that was going on within the government system that records the information. And that took them slightly longer than they're expecting to be able to resolve. And, and then for us to be able to upload that or complete that work and have that submission uploaded. Um, thank you. Uh, Chairman, could, could I just as a, by way of a supplementary press you, and I'm, I'm sorry to do this and put you on the spot, but um, in terms of uh, the functions of, of your committee, um, uh, what assurances will it be seeking um, uh, on the uh, risk related issues uh, to make sure that, um, that the council remains a, a going concern? I can assure you that I will be talking to, I will pick this up and I will be talking to uh, uh, both Joe and Sarah about how we uh, address this and bearing in mind that the committee does go into the reports thoroughly every time we receive them. Um, but I understand your concern and uh, if you'd like to email me that question so we get it exactly word for word, then we can uh, look at it outside this committee and then come back and report on it at the next meeting. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, just before you go to Councillor Bourne, can I just say my um, system dropped out partway through the answering to those questions. Hopefully I'm now back live. OK, thank you very much. Councillor Bourne. Uh, thank you, Chair, um, and I'd like to thank uh, EY for their very comprehensive report. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're, we're proud that we're not a run of the Mill District Council um, and, you know, there may be nine significant risks, um, but the audit report did not flag that any of these risks were not being managed correctly. So there's, you know, risk and reward. Uh, the report shows that the Council's made um, good investments and has prudently managed the issue of the interest rates by um, reserving. Um, investments have produced more income than council tax for this council, keeping the council tax down. Um, you know, people like to say the council's got lots of debt, but um, I think the you know the report backs up our, our claim that it's investments that's producing income for the council. And I think that the way that the risks are being managed um, is a credit to the officers, um, and um, you know is is a is a very positive thing for for Eastleigh. Uh, thank you, chair. OK, thank you very much. Are there any other comments on this part of the report? OK, I think I will ask for a proposer and seconder that we note this part of the report and then we'll go on to the second part. Is are members happy with that? Yeah, Could I ask for a proposer? Yeah. And of course, I'll take in, into account what um, Councillor Rzeski asked. Have to so propose. proposed by Councillor Paul, second year Councillor Irish. Mm -hmm. All those in favour? In favour. Yeah. Three. Yeah. Thank you very much. In uh, favour. Any, any against? Any abstentions? Okay, that's carried. So I believe we're over to Simon now to give the second part of the report. You are indeed, Chair. So <clears throat> thank you for that. So the, the second section of our item is our 2021 audit plan. So effectively the plan of work that we are proposing for the year to come. I should say that we're badging it very carefully as an outline at the moment. So we wanted to make sure that we got this plan to management and to you as those charged with governance prior to elections so you could consider it in a timely manner. So we brought it as early as we possibly can. So just to remind the committee of our base responsibilities, there are two main there are two main areas for us. So we give an opinion on your financial statements and we also comment on your arrangements for securing value for money. So I'll talk about those two things separately. So firstly, thinking about the opinion on the financial statements, the key part of that is the are, are the risks that you uh, that we consider in undertaking our work. So those are the things that drive audit effort and those risks are set out on page 47 of the papers. 
So you will seen by going through those, uh, they are they are consistent largely with the prior year. So the nine risks that we've referred to in the previous discussion are all still there. But of course, things move on over time. So our emphasis changes over time. So to just give you a few examples of those changes in emphasis. So if we were to think about the Aegeus Bowl, where we have a significant risk, clearly we've had a, a further year of lockdown restrictions under the, under the pandemic. Last year, there was an impairment to the carrying value of the asset on the council's balance sheet of 3.3 million based on reductions in income. That's something that would need to be reassessed given that there have been reduced level of income across the whole of the year. So it's something that we need to look at again. If you were to look at Horton Heath, so on Horton Heath, and we've talked about this a little bit, the council is moving now to the construction phase of the project. So again, that creates some financial accounting challenges and it will need it will mean that you need to present that differently in your financial statement. So again, that's something that we look at there. Similarly, on, on Horton Heath, and moving into the construction phase of the project, you plan to enter into significant borrowing over the course of the next year. So as we've talked about already, that's very relevant to our work on going concern and the forward look that we need to have over the council's cash flow forecasting for a year from when we sign the opinion. So again, we'd expect all of that to be properly factored into your going concern assessment. NNDR appeals provision is another example of where the focus of the risk has slightly changed. So again, with C19 and re attendant reductions in rateable value, many more businesses are raising appeals against uh, their NNDR rating. Therefore, we would expect, all things being equal, that appeals provision to increase in the council's account. So although most of the base risks for the financial statements are the same, they change over time to consider changes in circumstances. There is one new financial statements risk in the plan, which is set out on page 51 of your papers. This is around accounting for COVID-19 related government grants. So clearly over the course of the last year, year the council has received significant grants from government both to finance its own activities and also to pass through to various sections of Eastleigh so to local businesses etc we need to make sure that those accounts are being appropriately recognized and accounted for in the financial statements so that's a bit of a summary across the risks that we will consider in relation to the financial statements audit. If I could then move on to value for money, which is on page 66 of the supplementary agenda. So there has been a, there is a change in approach this year on value for money. So the NAO sets out the approach that we, the NAO being the National Audit Office, sets out the approach that all audit providers need to follow to discharge their responsibilities in relation to value for money. And it does this through issuing a code of audit practice that we are required to follow. A new code of audit practice was introduced in 2020 that will become applicable for 2021, um, our work in 2021. Um, so just to quickly talk you through some of the changes that that's brought in. So we will we will still assess the council against three defined criteria. So we'll look at financial sustainability. So all of the things that Sarah's just talked about around the, the adequacy of the medium term financial strategy we would want to consider there. We'll look at the council's governance arrangements. So does the council have enough information to allow members to take properly informed decisions and manage its risks? So again, maybe the, the movement from Horton Heath into construction phase is something that we would consider there. Finally, we need to consider whether overall the council has adequate arrangements for improving its economy efficiency and effectiveness. In terms of what's different on what you will see, we now need to do a broader risk assessment that covers all of those areas and report that fully to you. So in the past, our work has been focused on the risks we identify. We now need to do a broader assessment that covers all of those areas and report that risk assessment process back to the council. The, our end reporting will also be different. So the new code introduces the concept of an auditor annual report where we end up reporting our detailed, uh, our detailed VFM judgments. That needs to be done in a language that's accessible to the public and easily understandable. So again, that's something that we will be working on this year and something that you will see as a committee in due course. I think I will stop there, but very happy to take any questions. 
OK, before thank you for that, Simon. Before we do, um, can I just confirm Councillor Manning has now joined us. Were you able to join before this item started, Adam? Yes, I was. Thank you, Chair. Yes. So you've been here for the whole item. That's fine. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. OK, Councillor Atkinson. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and thank you, Simon, very much for the clear explanation of where hopefully we're going with 2021 audit. It was very, very informative paper. I, I must admit I was really quite intrigued reading the changes that are coming about under the new audit code for 2020 um, because they do seem to me to be quite significant changes. And I'm just wondering what the audit approach is going to be around that. In particular, what caught my eye was governance in how the council ensures that it makes informed decisions and properly manages its risks. Um, one, one of the things that have been concerning me is that we are going, as you rightly said earlier, into the development stage for one Horton Heath, which is quite clearly identified as a significant risk, but it's also a massive risk um, to council and a massive investment. We're, we're spending a lot of money here. And um, I'm just wondering, how the governments will play a part in reviewing that operation. Uh, one of the things, for example, I, I was looking at is the right for self delivery. And I just wondered whether that had been fully verified by council, because I can only trace that it's um, been agreed in principle and subject to various other matters. Um, uh, and that was cabinet paper of June 2019. So I was just intrigued whether there was an issue there and whether decisions now being taken are, are fully legal. Um, the other area that gives me cause of concern is we're using a, a significant number of consultants in this particular development, which um, is unusual for council. We usually use our own employees. Um, and I just wondered how the audit will relate around that in terms of procurement of those council services and the relevant fees that have been charged. Um, how, how does that audit work? I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how far you, you are able to look at that because they're not our employees. So um, I was just wondering about that one. And do, do you also look at a value for money in these type of um, transactions to make sure that the self delivery, for example, is the, the or was the, or indeed is maybe because I'm not quite sure where we are with that one, um, the right route for council. Um, so that there was sort of concerns of how the governance area is going to be audited. Will you also be looking perhaps more at the role of this committee and indeed policy and performance in understanding the supporting documents we have um, for our decision making and indeed cabinet? Um, what depth do you go into to be able to satisfy yourself that we have had the right information to be able to make informed decisions? Because that's the thrust of it. So um, I, I think that area intrigued me quite significantly and you can see why I was intrigued because it is completely new to the audit um, code and it's going to be a new area for us as a &R to be looking at when you report to us. Um, I don't know whether you want me to stop there. I did have another couple of other points, but that Shall is sort of the major thrust. Do you want to sort of take it as we go and then I'll come back? Yeah. Is that, would that be easiest? Shall we go through those first? Because there's quite quite a bit to unpack there, I think. So, in terms of so in terms of the the criteria around governance, there always was a criteria around informed decision making. So, whilst it it is it is new, it's not it's not entirely new from what we had previously. We'd want to look at the council's arrangements globally around governance. So there we would be looking at, do you have you know, effective risk management processes? Do you have effective performance management processes? How good is reporting to committee for any major decisions taken? You know what? What is the support behind them? So was there was the support accurate? Did it allow? Did it allow you know informed decisions to be taken? So we'd never you know we'd always look at it at a, at a, a council wide level. So we'd want to look at those arrangements holistically, but then probably drill down into areas of detail to kind of test it. And that would be the the approach that we would take to go in about that. 
on the point around around consultancy fees and all, and all of the rest of it. So again, there is a theme in there around procurement arrangements. So again, we'd want to look at, at procurement arrangements. Again, the approach would be similar. We can't look at every single procurement that goes on within the council in detail. So we'd want to look at those that would take forever and you know the cost would outweigh the benefit so we'd want to look at those arrangements globally but then probably test our conclusions by drilling down into specific areas and that that's how we would broadly go around all of that is that does that answer those questions margaret yeah i i think it does thank you simon um i i'm sure that when you report back to us we'll get a more in-depth report and feel of how those processes are working um, but I also wondered too whether you look at individual committees, for example, on one Horton Heath. I'm sorry, I keep going to that, but it's it's one that does have a specific board for itself. Is that looked at by the auditors, or is that just incorporated in the overall global structure? And similarly, with other um, perhaps smaller committees that wouldn't necessarily draw attention to the auditors because they are, are a bit further down the line. The main committees, of course, being A&R and policy and performance. So I think I, I think again, we would look at the the committee, the committee structure at a, at a council level and whether it's reasonable um, whether uh, that you've got you've got a committee structure that would allow for effective scrutiny and challenge. Again, our ability to look at every single committee <laughs> in detail you know that's just not that's just not going to be possible so we'd need to look at it globally and then perhaps drill down to test as appropriate so i think it's a similar response to previous yeah. if, if i might chip in at this point um chair just in terms of the the change that we've had um uh, margaret is is around look making doing a detailed risk assessment as, as simon has explained and the focus of the wording in the code has changed to um identifying a risk of a significant weakness in the arrangements. Now, before it was a significant risk to the arrangements. And so I think what it what it means in terms of our planning is that we need to be much more comprehensive and look across the organisation down to a level of detail that perhaps we haven't been required to do in the past. And where we identify a risk of a significant weakness, then we would do some targeted work. So, for example, if we felt that um, particular, you know, for example, Horton Heath, if it's a significant decision which we're already looking at under going concern in terms of any further um, debt that's taken out, if there's um, governance arrangements in terms of how the decisions are being taken, if there's um, options appraisal in terms of how that um, whole scheme is being managed, and we felt that there was a risk of a significant weakness in any of those elements from our initial review, then we would then we would be obliged under the code to do further work and then report that back in our commentary um, with a view that, that the design of the code is to try to move to much more targeted and, and deeper work, further work, which may then highlight issues that perhaps in the past the code hasn't allowed for because it's stayed at too high a level, too global a level, to use Simon's words. So I think I think that's the the, the major change that you'll see in the way in which um, the approach works. Thank, thank you for that explanation. That that's really helpful. Thank you very much. Um, just going on a little bit, a couple of other points I picked up on. Under the significant risks, clearly we've got all the same ones plus the extra one surrounding uh, around COVID um, grant issues. But what intrigued me was that under the significant risks, you've actually added, I think, in some areas, um, significant and fraud risk. And I think the word fraud has crept in this year, whereas it, I know it was probably underlying or uh, in, in previous years, but it's specifically identified this year. So that interested me. I think the other area that interested me is, uh, as you've just mentioned, Janet, you've looked at weaknesses in internal controls. Does that mean you will, will be wanting our internal audit processes to be as robust uh, as possible and you will be perhaps looking at those? Um, I, I know you've been present at a &R meetings where I've had conversations with Jo and she's reported um, weaknesses in internal control certain areas and I'm not remotely trying to suggest that's across the board because it isn't. Um, 
But I just wondered what you would pick up in that respect. Particularly, I do happen to know that some of these um, internal audit issues haven't been resolved for more than a year. Again, I know that's a, a very comparatively low number, but it is still an issue. And some of those issues are significant weaknesses that have been reported and not resolved. OK, shall I, shall I take those? So talking about fraud risks to start with. So we have we've always identified significant fraud risks and they, they would they will have been in in every year's plan that I've you know that I've had anything to do with. That's always been there. So if you remember auditing standards require us to presume that management will override controls to commit finan financial reporting fraud and that's an assumption that we need to apply on all of our audits. So we always have that management override fraud risk in there. We then think about that at a more granular level and how it might apply to particular council. So for example, if there is significant capital spending, which there is at Eastley, that would we would always say there's an incentive for management to inappropriately capitalise revenue expenditure because there is more pressure on the revenue budget than often there is on the capital budget and you, you're, you're allowed to um, utilise different financing sources for capital spend. So there is incentive for management to charge revenue spend to capital. So I suppose the summary answer to the question is we always raise those fraud risks. Auditing standards require us to do so and they've always been in our plans. Those are the risks that you would expect to see. In relation to the second point on internal audit, so we don't directly rely on the work of internal audit to inform our audit approach. So we don't take direct reliance from the controls testing that internal audit does. However, we recognise it's an integral part of your control framework. So we're required to consider your entity level controls and one of those is internal audit. So again, we'd want to look at the, the efficacy of the internal audit function as part of that assessment, but also look at what the, <coughs> excuse me, the internal audit function has been reporting when we do that. If we think about value for money and the risk assessment process that Janet has just described, one of the key sources of information for that is the work of internal audit. So we would look at findings from internal audit reports and um, try to ascertain whether they suggest any significant weakness in arrangements, as Janet suggested. So we'd use the work of internal audit to direct our effort. So whilst we don't directly rely on the work of internal audit, it's very relevant to a number of our responsibilities and we use it to target our target our effort appropriately. Thank you. That's that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, I could probably drill down a lot more, but I, I probably covered the the main points that I just wanted to ask you tonight and just say thank you again for being so clear in your um, your outline plan. Uh, which is very helpful and hopefully going forward well I look forward to hearing the uh, the outcomes in due course. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. Um, can I ask Sarah and Joe if either of you want to come in on those questions before I move on? Sarah. Um, yes, Chair, I think the uh, I think the, the point I, I'd like to pick up is just the one on governance and Obviously, that's at the heart of everything we do, and um, particularly because we are public sector and we want to be sure to be seen to be doing it right and to be doing it right. And one of the things we've done to try and push that more to the fore is we've just restructured our senior leadership team. And in there now, we do have an executive head of governance, which is Joe, who you all know as our um, Chief Internal Auditor, but uh, no pressure, Joe. But it it brings that very much to the fore. And Internal Audit have already done an internal audit on um, the governance arrangements around Horton Heath, and they'll be doing um, similar work in the future. So I don't want to steal your thunder, Joe. If you want to come in, it's up to you. But um, yeah, just those sorts of things that give members a little bit more comfort that that's where Joe's plan has um, changed over the years as the risks around the council change, and how we ref we have reflected that by bringing in a whole head of governance. To, to make sure that all that transparency and that member information is all there. That's all I wanted to add, Chair. OK, thank you very much. Joe. did you want to come in talk? If, if I may, yeah. Um, just to add, I, I was sort of making some notes as we're, we're going along there. Um, the actual internal audit plan, which I'll be presenting in a couple of items time, uh, does include um, time in there for us to look again at the um, governance arrangements for One Horton Heath. So we did that piece of work you recall last year um, and the report came, some of the report came to you in December and there are some recommendations um, still around that that need to be followed up. So there's some time 
as I think for the next number of years, we've got time in every year for this because it's such a, a massive project. We've got time in the plan um, to look at governance arrangements. I keep saying we, but of course, this is where I'm going to be sort of stepping away and handing it over to Lisa. And there's also time um, for contract management. So some of those risks that Margaret has highlighted will indeed, they've, they've come up within my risk assessment of the audit universe and have been included in the internal audit plan. Thank you very much for that. Can I ask if there's any other member who wishes to ask a question? OK, thank you. In that case, can I have a proposal and seconder that we note the report and uh, pick up as yeah. a team, officer team, all the yeah. issues? Thank you. Who was that? Who indicated? Alex. Thank you. Right. Councillor Bourne proposed. Councillor second. Uh, Councillor Iris seconded. Yeah. All in favour? Agreed. 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 Any against? Any abstentions? Thank you very much. That's carried. And I'm sure that um, the officer team will continue to work extremely hard on ensuring that uh, we tick all the boxes and, and do the right thing and uh, we will be getting reports back to us over the next year to ensure that that happens okay moving on to item seven and by the way thank you to both simon and uh sorry you've disappeared <laughs> janet <laughs> for your contributions and you're welcome to stay. Item seven is the internal audit strategic plan 2021-22. Sorry, ask... Chair. Sorry, um, item six, I think you've skipped over. Beg your pardon, item six is the internal audit charter 2021-22. I'm using a scrolling script and it's quite difficult to stop it in the right place. Thank you. Joe. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Right. Um, councillors, you'll be familiar with this. I bring this to um, this meeting every year as required by the standards. This is the charter that um, talks about the standards that we will work to and operate, um, how we arrive at our conclusion, um, our I say are where we stand within the organisation to ensure independence. And of course, things are slightly different this year. Um, with my new role as Executive Head of Governance. So I have updated the Charter and if I can draw your attention in the appendices to page 15 and um, paragraph 3.4 um, has been added to explain that I am the Executive Head of Governance and um, in May I'll be appointed as a monitoring officer. Um, so therefore there is, you know, a bit of a conflict between those two roles. So for the purpose of this coming year, um, I'll be accountable as the qualified internal auditor and Lisa, who we all met uh, before we went live earlier this evening, our senior auditor will take over the responsibility for delivery of the plan. So that's been captured in that paragraph. Um, I don't think there are any other significant changes this year other than, um, as I've just said, adding in the uh, internal audit senior posts into um, a few of the paragraphs. So I'm happy to take any questions. Sorry, Councillor Atkinson, you've got a question? I, I have. Hello, Joe. Hello. Sorry. Um, yes, thank you, Joe, for uh, presenting this, uh, as always, so, uh, so clearly to us. I have to say, um, I'm going to voice my concerns again, which I did at the last meeting in your dual roles of head uh, of governance and acting effectively acting um, head of internal audit. Quite frankly, I don't think the roles are compatible and it is putting you in a very difficult position. Um, because you effectively you're auditing yourself or could be on some occasions. I do recognise the difficulty 
that you have in having a head of internal audit because that does require somebody with the appropriate qualification and you are the only person as I understand it within the internal audit team that has that qualification at the moment. But I would ask that we have a time limit put on the length of time that you are put in that dual role. I can understand that whilst there's a handover issue or a replacement posting issue, I can understand why there is the need to do it. But it is really something that I am very uncomfortable with. And I would like that noted, please, Chair, because I think it is putting Joe in a very difficult position. And I think we as an audit committee should be requesting that there is a time limit to, on the extent that Jo has the, that dual role because she can't possibly sign the annual governance statement, I don't think, at the end of the year with her dual role. I think that really does need to be signed by somebody who is appointed head of internal audit. Um, that's my opinion, others may disagree, but I am very uncomfortable with the situation. Um, hence, reading the internal audit charter, I have to say I'm a little bit concerned that it's been rewritten to accommodate the position that we're in rather than written as um, as I think it should be as it was last year because I, I did look at last year's and looked at this one. I can see why the, the, the changes where you sort of substituted um, the executive head of governance uh, instead of internal um, head of internal audit. Personally, I don't feel that the internal audit charter wording should be changed to accommodate the position that we've got. We recognise that you are actually acting at the moment as head of internal audit because of the need. But I think the, the duties of the head of internal audit should stay exactly the same as they were last year and that you as executive head of governance should actually be removed from the um, internal audit charter document um, because it, it's the role, not the person that should be accounted for, I think, in the charter. Um, the, I, I feel I have to say that because I understand the requirements of your own professional body and those requirements on you, uh, I recognise the huge difficulty you're putting yourself in because it's possibly compromising your profession, own professional standards. And I just don't like seeing you put in that position. Um, so I, I raise that as an issue and whether therefore we should revisit the internal audit charter to look at rewording it to take reference to head of governance out of the internal audit charter and replace it with head of internal audit. We can note in the document that at the moment you are currently acting as head of internal audit, which you are. Um, until it can be resolved. And as I said, I would like a time limit put on that. So that's my big issue this year with that. Um, the other thing that I did um, want to just raise is that you have altered, I think it's on page 24, um, it's Annex 2, it's the recommendations and the priorities and somewhere I think you have changed the time scale for um, auditing. Uh, it's, it's somewhere to do with the testing of two to three years instead of by annually. By in, by annually. Now I'm not quite sure to be honest from my notes I sort of did the audit plan and the internal audit charter together because it was just easier for me to do it like that. But I did wonder whether that was um, in here or whether actually I can't remember whether it's in here or whether I need to do it under audit plan. Um, but going back to page 24, you have actually changed the wording of that quite a bit, if I'm honest, because you've missed out a whole paragraph from the previous year and sort of taken out the paragraph relating to audit objectives are established for each assignment. Each objective is assessed and the results are used to form an overall position. And the recommendations are recommendations are graded accordingly, whereas before you had in there and then go on, you, you go on then to say to assist management with prioritizing implementation as follows, etc. But previously you had the potential interest um, risk 
presented to assist management with, and then it goes on to say this is the risk prior to any mitigation and is designed to assist management with the prioritization implementation as follows. So the wording has changed and it's sort of omitting some of the things that you had in the internal chart before and I just wonder why you've done that. Okay, um, uh, if I explain um, first your first point about the um, role of the executive head, more than happy to do that. I mean, um, I think I was just keen that it was minuted and documented somewhere that that is the situation that I'm I'm covering the role for the interim. So I'm more than happy that we can take it out of the charter for 21-22. And as long as we've got it recorded in the minutes and everyone's aware and um, Sarah and I can have a chat about the timescales. I mean, I, I'd like to think that once things settle, I'll, I'll be able to have a look at the, the whole structure of the team and we can um, come to some resolution there. With regards to Annex, to, yes, you're right, we did change it. Um, it it became um, for officers, we were trying to simplify it a bit because um, of course a lot of the time we talk about controls, compliance, um, we know what we're talking about, but officers sometimes think, what what, what do you mean? So originally we would have every single um, audit objective in a piece of work, we would have uh, given an opinion to each of those and then would have collated that together to form an overall opinion. So um, effectively, we'll be doing that behind the scenes. But we didn't feel it was necessary to put that here to confuse people. So basically, we'll come up with one overall in the report at the moment on the executive summary. They see the overall conclusion as nil limited, adequate or substantial. With regards to the priorities, I do recall we did have a um, discussion at a &R, I think it was last year because there had been, I think um, one of the councillors spotted a typo and I did correct it and um, shared the rewording with you all. So hopefully you have seen this um, before. Apologies if 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 not. Um, again, it was just to try and um, simplify the language that we used um, so that everyone understood what we meant when we were talking about critical risks, high risks, medium risks and low risks. And I know we've debated the um, timescales around whether it's immediate whether it's a month, whether it's two months. And to be honest, um, as ideally, yes, things will be done immediately, but, but we know that just unfortunately, because of decision making processes, um, time taken to implement any new revised processes, that immediate and four weeks was always an unrealistic target. So we we're always going to fail with that. So I think we'd agreed, and when I've discussed this with, with you all before, that um, really it was down to us as auditors to agree that we were comfortable with that time scale that officers put in place for addressing the risk highlighted and that if we weren't comfortable that we would raise that and say no we yeah we can't wait six months it needs to be done now so that that was the reason we sort of tried to simplify that i hope that yes it does i i i must admit i don't remember you bringing it to a and r before but if you if, i'm sure you if you said it was informally, I'll be honest. I, I don't doubt you at all. I know. Um, I think, uh, to be honest, I think it was informally. I probably shared it um, around the committee via email. I, I don't. I don't specifically remember it, but that that could be my fault, not yours. Um, so yes, I understand that. I did question timescale for implementation. I did put some question marks. I knew we had the discussion about that. Um, I have to say that personally, I would like to see some sort of um, maximum time scale for critical risk and high risk because those are significant risks and they uh, what I'm seeing at the moment is the risks uh, recommendations to correct the risks are not being implemented necessarily on a timely basis mm -hmm. and I, I must admit I would prefer to see some time scale on the the two risks that are one and two because they if they're risks are rated at that degree of priority then there is a good reason for that risk being rated like that therefore there's a good reason to get the, the to get the recommendation implemented as quickly as possible can i um just add on that um that's you've made a very good point there with regards to the risks so of course um under well i i took over responsibility for corporate risk management for the coordination of it in September and under um, my new role as executive head I'm responsible for that coordination still so already the executive heads we've had discussions about how we can link in um, the operational the corporate risk registers with audit recommendations and um, 
and there, there's an action for me to have a look and add them to them. So those sorts of things are slowly coming through as part of my new role. Thank you, Joe. I, I think you, you're obviously going to be very good in your new role. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? I can't see anything in the chat. I'll hand back to you then, Chair, please, if it's OK. Um. I think we have a technical problem. I was going to say, the, I my screen. So I gone. think Councillor Holes has dropped off the call, so okay. I assume he's trying to rejoin. Um, Councillor Bourne, sorry to say this to you, are you um, are you able to pick up from this point um, for the proposer and the seconder? Yes, of course. I'm just trying to find my script as well. But yeah, if we could, if I could have a proposer, please. For I'll propose um, to fully. Yeah, thank I'll you, second. Yeah. Yeah. And Councillor Dean, I heard second. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, if we could all um, unmute and agree to um, that, that would be great. Thank you. Agreed. 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 Does, does anyone? Uh, can I just? I'm sorry to interrupt, but I did ask for some changes to be made to the internal charter which I thought Jo was thinking she would be doing. Um, so what are we actually voting on, please? Uh, jo, were you, you were happy with those um, I, with those changes. And can I ask the rest of the committee if anyone has any objections to those changes? Because they did seem to make sense to me. Sorry, no, Councillor. Perfectly, perfectly happy with that. Does, does, can someone, does, if anyone disagrees, could they say no? Excellent. So, OK, sorry. So if we could vote on an, um, the amendments um, as as you, you understand them, Joe, I think yes. it, it was quite clear. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so if we can all um, mute and agree, that would be great. Agree? Agreed. 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 Any anyone against and any abstentions? Thank you. So that's carried. And the next item is the plan. So is that back to you, Joe? Yes, that's over to me. Thank you. Right. Let me get my paper ready. Right. So this is the internal audit plan for 2021-22. Um, hopefully we've all had a chance to have a look and read through it. But I can just draw your attention to paragraph four um, on page 25 and paragraph five apologies on page 26, which talks about the internal audit resources. Um, and just to share some good news with you um, that Tom, who is on this call and you met earlier, will be um, continuing his development with us and is staying to do a level seven internal audit apprenticeship scheme, which will at the end of the three years, he'll become a fully qualified internal auditor. So that's some really, really positive news. Um, so you'll be aware that previous plans had only had the resource in until about October. Um, Tom has worked really well in um, lockdown and has actually is going to achieve it ahead, ahead of schedule. So I just thought I wanted to share that piece of news with you all. Um, with regards to the actual plan, so the appendix, if I can just take you through that. Uh, it, Councillor Atkinson, you did already, you've raised the query about the audit every two to three years. You're right, I have had to change that um, just because you'd be aware that the financial, the key ones at the start of the audit universe, so the traditional um, ones around accounts receivable, accounts payable, payroll, those will still be done every two years. But the others that are high, um, I've, some have had needed to just slip a little bit so that we can recover from the last year with COVID. Um, once we get through this year, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can pull it back to every two years, but we just need that little bit of flexibility in the plan. And that's probably the other thing to mention with this is, of course, you will all be aware last year um, 
I revised the plan three times. So this is going to have to be a very fluid and flexible plan uh, because we're still not through the whole COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so this is based on risk today and of course it may be subject to change as the year progresses. The plan itself, we um, need to buy in some casual resource just to make sure that we can deliver the plan. So there's a suggestion of 93 days. It costs about ten and a half thousand pounds. Um, and just to summarise, I feel it's a very it's a robust plan. Um, there's approximately 27 audits that are planned for the year, um, and it, it reflects the risk that we're we've had with the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll be looking at um, one Horton Heath again, asset management and other areas. So I'm happy to take questions. I hope you can all still hear me because I can see technical problems. Are we all still here? Uh, I can hear you. Lovely. Yeah, you. Lovely. I thought I was talking to an empty room then. <laughs> Brilliant. Right. So uh, questions. Margaret. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Um, you've already answered one of the questions that I had, so thank you for that. Um, and yes, I picked up too that some high risk areas are not being audited this year. I think uh, having looked at those, the one that perhaps concerns me the most that isn't being audited is commercial rents. Um, this is clearly an area that um, council is very vulnerable in at the moment and it's already been highlighted by the external auditors as, as possibly a high risk area relating to um, property and the need for income. So I did wonder why that one had been omitted uh, in particular. Um, I also noted too that the overall number of audit days have reduced by 47, which I thought was a bit of a shame. Um, and I did wonder whether you needed more audit resource in addition to the 93 days that you're buying in. I have to say, in talking for value for money, I think you did a very good deal in being able to buy that in at ten and a half thousand pounds. <laughs> so well done you. Um, but other, other than that, um, I have just marked my notes, page 29. I didn't, oh yes. On page 29, paragraph eight, I was a little confused um, because you're talking in the future here. It is envisaged that there will be nine service plans um, for each of the executive areas to support the corporate strategy and the 10 corporate objectives. But last year in the same plan, you were saying you already had nine services for the 10 corporate objectives. So I'm not quite sure why we're talking for in the future if it was there last year. Has something changed? Uh, am I missing something here? No, so that was a bit of confusion for me. And I think those are my those are my points, please. OK, if I can um, just respond then about paragraph eight. So, of course, with the reorganisation, some things have moved around um, and although there are still now nine areas. Those business plans are going to need a little bit of um, restructuring and shuffling to move things back into the new areas. So um, some movements between environment and neighbourhood services. Of course, um, performance and governance was in the strategy directorate and it's now come over um, under me in governance. And of course, we've sort of joined up with a few of the support um, services. So it's support services areas. So it's a, just a little bit of reconfiguring to get everything under the right umbrella and right banner if I'm um, just to explain that. So you've still got nine, they're, they're nine different service areas then from the ones that you had last year? Yes. Do you know it would be really helpful, I don't know whether it's possible to have a full organisation chart so that we can understand please what these service areas are, it would give us a much better understanding of, of yeah. how we're auditing, thank you. That's fine. Um, we've got a very high level um, structure chart, but I can ask for that to be circulated to you all that explains who comes under which team now. Yep. Thank you very much. That'd be very helpful. OK, and um, your other question regarding commercial rents. We are doing so we did that review um, a year ago. We finished that um, just about. I think we paused it just before we went into lockdown and then finished it late spring and we've just started a follow-up review on that as part of quarter four of 2021 
and that will, as well as following up the audit recommendations, it's also looking at the impact of COVID-19. So it's being done now, if that can give you some reassurance on that, so that it, I didn't feel it was necessary to keep it in the plan for next year. Um, else did I scribble? Apologies, you had the commercial base. Oh, the, the, the yes. Extra resources, have you got enough? Um, yes, I'm comfortable that the plan I've pulled together is enough to be able to give that level of opinion and assurance for the council. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we're, we're still having some technical issues, but I'll hand it back over to you, Councillor Bourne. Thank you uh, very much, Jo. Um, so just just last call for any more questions on on this one. No. OK, so we'd now like to uh, recommend that the committee notes the contents of this report. Do I have a proposer, please? I'll propose a chair. Thank you, Councillor Irish. And do, can I have a seconder, please? Yeah, I'll second it. Councillor Trace. Councillor Trace, I believe. Thank you very much. OK, can we all unmute and if you agree, please uh, say agree. 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 Uh, does, does anybody um, not agree? And does anyone want to abstain? Thank you very much, councillors. So that's passed. Um, the next item was verbal updates from um, Strategic Risk Management Group and PEG, but I believe that those meetings are due to be held later this week and next week. Yeah. Um, is that correct? Yes, yes. That's, okay, cousin, uh, Chair. that's correct, yeah. Chair. I'm going to SRMG on Thursday in place of Councillor Tyson Payne, so that's on Thursday. Yeah. Mm. Excellent. Mm. So uh, the next item is the action list. Um, and can I bring in Sarah for this? Yes, thank you, Councillor Bourne. Um, so there was only one item on the action list, which was to do with um, Joe, actually, and the internal audit team and um, getting some independent verification. So uh, uh, do you have an update on that, Joe? Possibly not at the moment. But... No, but the time is included. I should have mentioned that. Apologies. The time is included in next year's plan um, to try and progress that. But of course, it's all been paused because of the pandemic, unfortunately. Yes. Um, that was the only action, Chair. Thank you. Sorry, I just saw Councillor Hull's pack and I didn't know who it was taking over. Um, so the next item is the Cabinet Forward Plan. Does anybody have any questions on that? Alex, can I just... Uh... Yeah, certainly. Thank you, Acting Chair. Um, so I have been able to get back online. I was just finding my agenda. Um, I don't know what went wrong, but uh, I'm OK now. But I'll let you finish this item. And uh, thank you very much. No problem. So uh, we don't appear to have any questions on the Cabinet Forward Plan. So in that case, could I have a proposer, please? Proposed, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Irish, and a seconder. I'll second. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Tennant. OK, so if we could all unmute and if uh, if you agree, please say agree. 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 <clears throat> Anyone disagree? And any abstentions? I'll abstain, Chair. OK, thank you. So that is carried. So, uh, Councillor Holes, I hand back to you on uh, item 11. Thank you very much. And uh, item 11 would be, because I'm still trying to find the agenda. The ANR work programme. Thank you. Um, Sarah, can I ask whether we've got anything to add to that work programme or anything to move yeah um i don't believe so chair so
So if you when you look at the work programme, we've tried to flesh it out more. So we've tried to go a full year in advance now and we've tried to spread the work out over the meetings for the year. So um, yeah, happy to move things around and, and think things through. But I think everything's pretty much set now. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Any members got any questions on the work programme? No. Chair. OK, um, so thank you very much. Chair, can I just mention that Councillor Rushton's now joined the meeting? Thank you very much, Councillor Rushton. We've had some fun tonight. I've gone offline and Alex has taken over and I'm back now. So welcome to the chaos that is tonight's meeting. Thank you very I much. I think we're getting there though. <laughs> OK, item 12. Is Sarah? Sorry, I still haven't got oh, my agenda. Sorry, um, item 12 is the exempt business, so to oh. pass so that we can move into exempt for item 13. OK. Do um, you want me to read that out, Councillor Holes, if I've got that in front of me? Yes, please, because I haven't got it. Yeah, no problem. So, Councillors, as part of item 12, we need to consider whether to pass the resolution, whether an item 13 should be exempt from disclosure and if the public can and if the public interest in not disclosing information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information. May I have a proposer to pass the resolution? I'll I'll propose it. Propose it. Okay, who was proposing? Oh, I did, uh, Councillor Irish. Thank you, Councillor Irish, and who seconded? I'll second. Councillor Manning, okay. Thank you for reading that out, Alex. All in favour? In favour. In favour. Any against? Any abstentions? In that case, we will be moving to the exempt agenda. Members, you'll have to log out and log back in on the Teams meeting for that item. Thank you for all for attending. Sorry for the uh, mishap where I disappeared for a few minutes. Uh, modern technology at its best but we got there and uh, can I just say before we go good luck to anybody standing in the elections uh, coming up in May some of us will be and uh, thank you to Councillor Trace who won't be restanding for your work over the last two years. Thanks Chair. If, if we can log that thank you very much and see you all in a few minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you.